Ay, ay, ay. Look at this mess. I was on this train with all these people as we suddenly had an accident. I don't really know what happened. If it's an operator's problem or a technical error, I can really tell. But the train seems not to be derailed. And this is a good thing. I heard some people talk. They said that the train driver was bitten by a monkey and somehow like this the train came to stop. But strangely enough, since I'm here, I have not seen any train driver or monkey at all. Just some lizards here and there. Yes, and now they are arguing how to repair the train and how to get it moving again. You see the gentleman over there with the cane and the top hat? He says he knows exactly how to repair the train and get it moving again. He even wants to drive the train himself. Hmm. Somehow he looks like he knows what he's talking about, but can you tell just by looks and appearance? He even said that he knows how the beginning of the tunnel looks like. The beginning of the tunnel. I can't recognize anything from here. Can you recognize the beginning of the tunnel? Can you see anything? Mm. You can't either? Then let me try with this. Maybe with this, something. Let's see. Hmm. Nah, this is not working either. Nobody has ever seen the beginning of the tunnel. Anyways, let's start with our first episode. Welcome to the first episode of Rethinking Evolution Theory. In these videos we want to discuss the evolution theory by Charles Darwin. We will look up original sources and we will consider if the presented evidence is plausible and still holds up today or not. These videos are a process of thinking out loud in which we want to invite you to research the original sources yourself and to come to your own results and to share them with us in the comment section. Nullius in verba is the slogan of the Royal Society and means something like take nobody's word for it and is intended to remind the scientist of a certain scientific approach to strive for and to give courage to shake fundamental assumptions and perspectives. Also the quote, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-inflicted immaturity by the philosopher Immanuel Kant conveys similar values. Such sayings are easy to let go of, but what about the practical implementation of them in your personal life and in educational institutes. Are you really trying to satisfy your thirst for knowledge or are you trying to give yourself fake answers so you don't get a headache and you can go to sleep in peace? Access to information was not always as easy as today. We live in a generation in which society has seemingly endless access to information through electronic devices that flood the market. If you look at the history of writing and writing equipment, you realize that the preservation and transmission of information went through a process of thousands of years. Often societies and communities were dependent on subjective narrators, scholars and documents without any possible source for comparison. So getting your own view or opinion on a topic was therefore extremely difficult or sometimes impossible. But this has no longer been the case since the era of the internet and the specificity of that on science cannot be overemphasized. You don't even need the ability to read to examine an aspect from multiple perspectives through video platforms. Contacting and consulting experts on specific fields on the other side of the world are eventually possible today through just a few clicks. The curiosity and the joy for discoveries were and are powerful and influential factors on the development of science and technology. History has shown that not ignorance is the biggest obstacle for gaining knowledge but more the illusion of knowledge. Because the healthy development of gaining knowledge is paralyzed by false and general accepted views. These videos aim to create a greater awareness for unreasonable methods, assumptions and results in schools and universities. And to motivate the students and teachers to question and test ideas that are taken for granted. What is knowledge? What is science? How can you 
acquire knowledge. Are all informations in an educational script also scientifically proven? The field of philosophy that deals with these questions is called epistemology and must be faced if one is striving for truth. Many philosophers from various cultures have dealt with these questions. One of the most striking achievements in the history of science are the cognitive concepts of Lord Francis Bacon, who is considered the founder of the scientific method and therefore paved the way for the scientific revolution and modern science. This way of thinking has produced very fruitful results with pragmatic applications in engineering, chemistry and medicine. Francis Bacon's main work is called Novum Organum Scientiarum, which means new tool of sciences. And already the title promises some kind of practical application. Lord Bacon begins by addressing the problem of the illusion of knowledge. They who have presumed to dogmatize on nature as on some well-investigated subject, either from self-conceit or arrogance, and in a professional style, have inflicted the greatest injury on philosophy and learning, for they have tended to stifle and interrupt inquiry exactly in the proportion as they have prevailed in bringing others to their opinion. And their own activity has not counterbalanced the mischief they have occasioned by corrupting and destroying that of others. In this quote Bacon writes about a certain conceit and arrogance that existed among the natural scientists, which led them to dogmatize scientific topics and consider nature as well studied. Assumptions that emerged from Greek antiquity were considered inviolable truths. In this context, Bacon sees Aristotle in particular as a leading figure. The viewer might think that such an attitude can no longer dominate scientific institutions since the era of enlightenment. We live in an enlightened society, or do we not? If you think about the current naming of this era, enlightenment, which was full of discoveries and inventions, it conveys that humanity was living in darkness and now lives in a status of light. The German word for the era enlightenment is Aufklärung and means something like clarification and conveys a similar image, namely that the sight of humanity was blurred or clouded and now there is a clear view. Both of these scenarios convey a unique event that was accomplished by previous generations of which current generations are benefiting from. The antithesis, dark and light, blur and clear, show that we are now in the status of knowledge and reflect the same conceit and arrogance Bacon writes about. Analogous to the assumptions of the natural philosophers of ancient Greece, today existing dogmas will be discussed in the following videos. Voltaire considered Bacon the father of experimental philosophy. Why this is the case becomes clear when you read Bacon's work Novum Organum Scientiarum, which emphasizes the indispensable importance of the verifiability of claims. It is possible to make a wide variety of claims and declare them for true without presenting any evidence, but would that be considered science? You can take for example an iron ingot and claim that this iron ingot was made out of gold an unthinkable long time ago and that the atomic components of the gold transformed into iron through an unthinkable long time span. However such a statement cannot be tested because an unthinkable long time is beyond the temporal range of every human being because of the limited lifetime every human has and nobody can travel into the past. Because such statements are untestable, they become also unfalsifiable and thus opens a scope for arbitrary claims, claims that nobody can prove and nobody can disprove. A person who strives for knowledge has to be aware of this limitation in time, otherwise you run the risk to accept assumptions that are not built on any scientific foundation. Apart from the limitation in time, which we will discuss in the course of these videos, there is also a certain local limitation, which lead to places about which very little or no scientific information can be made. Examples of this include the innermost core of the earth, because there are no machines that can reach there, and places that are unthinkable far away from our planet. Bacon writes that true statements and axioms can be derived 
from experiments. So if claims are made about which no experiments can be carried out because of time limitation or local limitation, these claims do not correspond to the scientific method of Francis Bacon. Bacon therefore emphasizes that the prerequisite for gaining scientific knowledge are experiments that can be validated or falsified. For example, Newton's laws of motion can be proven any time in various laboratories. They are very pragmatic and are used every day in technical designs. They can predict how mechanical systems will behave with given initial conditions. Franz Kafka describes humanity in a parable as follows. Seen with the earthly eye, we are in a situation of train passengers who have had an accident in a long tunnel. At a point where one can no longer see the light of the beginning, but the light of the end is so tiny that the eye has to keep looking for it and always loses it, whereby the beginning and the end are not even certain. So humanity doesn't really know its exact origin or end. However, when you open up school books, you get the impression that at least the initial part of this tunnel is no big mystery no more and that the questions about it are solved questions that are no longer worth pondering over. But from a chronological point of view, these questions are beyond human reach. Or are there any contemporary witnesses that witness the origin of the earth or of life? It is also not possible to replicate geological or biological origins in laboratories. Therefore, an essential stage in the process of acquiring knowledge according to Bacon is missing. And this leads to the birth of scientific myths. These are assumptions that are considered by the general society as scientifically proven, although they don't meet the criteria for the scientific method. At this point, the viewers are asked always to question and to examine the epistemology of an alleged scientific achievement. I really recommend you to read Novum Organum Scientiarum yourself, because the works of Francis Bacon had and still have an immense influence on science. This will give you a broad understanding for our epistemology and our future thought process. We are now at the end of our episode. In the next episodes we will discuss geological requirements for the Darwinian evolution theory and the reliability of dating methods. I hope you liked this episode and that I see you in the next episodes. Bye!